much bigger than I had originally imagined. And to me, as a macroeconomist, the most fascinating and most important aspect I see about Web3 is that it is actually a huge revolution in how we produce and distribute economic values in our society that is being enabled by technology. So we can talk more about that later, but um, I started writing about Web3 uh, a while ago, and like everybody sitting here, I started researching and thinking more and more about the space. And uh, never in a million years did I expect none of my writings to go viral, because there's always been a personal interest, kind of nerdy thing, as like, why would anybody else be interested, right? But um, some of my writings really resonated with uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people, and uh, otherwise I wouldn't have been sitting here today. So today we are going to talk about some of the predictions and trends in how Web3 are going to affect the financial regimes and monetary regime as we know it, and how it's going to affect individual livelihood and work. Exactly. So uh, getting right to one of these uh, viral writings. Um, so you wrote an article detailing 10, I believe, uh, 11, 10 or 11 of the major uh, prophecies, as you call them, of what's going to happen. I, I wouldn't call them major, just to get us started to thinking. To get us started, at least, that's right. And certainly these are going to change as the, <laughs> thank you, Josh, as the environment changes uh, over the next couple of years, regulatory environment. Um, but uh, you divided them into two major categories, uh, on the institutional and fiscal monetary side, and then on the individual side that should, uh, a lot of you, I'm sure, are, are already affected by doing yield farming and whatever else you do uh, as, as new income streams. So uh, let's maybe get started on the institutional side. Um, what are some of the major things that you see coming? So one of the trends that I think will be, it's already playing out, but I think will play out so much more in the next decades or next two decades is the hyper tokenization of everything that has value. So I, I expect we, work, we are going to see the majority of assets on this planet to have some kind of tokenization form, be it real estate or bonds or stocks or you know um, any kind of income generating assets. And there will be new assets invented in a tokenized form um, for anything that has its cash flow attached to it. And, um, you know, I, I think that the driver for this trend to be happening is more and more liquidity is moving on chain. And that, I see, is an inevitable trend. And in the Web3 space, liquidity is just like eyeballs in Web2. So in Web2, you know, uh, once internet took off, we have more and more people started building websites. Everybody had, had to have a website on the internet. And once we started using, so using social media, everybody had to have an Instagram or Facebook profile. Why? Because that's where the eyeballs are. And in the Web3, on-chain economy is going to be where the liquidities are. And if you want to raise funding, if you want to sell any kind of financial product, you have to go on-chain. That's why liquidity is going to drive more liquidities on-chain, and eventually the majority of assets are going to take on some kind of tokenized form in the future. Um, I've, I've had for many years the idea that one of the biggest value props of crypto was the ability to drive liquidity uh, in asset classes and um, you absolutely nailed it. I think it's even, this is all happening even before we have a clear way on how to move cash flows back into the tokenized world because right now we don't exactly have like a clean framework exactly in the same way that we would have with equities, for example. Uh, cash flows that directly translate into, into value for equities. Uh, but in a hyper-tokenized world where everybody is creating a token for everything, does that pose any challenges for us? Does it pose any issues that every liquidity can be too fragmented, even though everything has liquidity now? Well, there's definitely going to be a lot of financial stability challenge, regulatory challenges, right? We probably don't have time to get into all that. It's very complicated no, matter. No. <laughs> but I would say overall on, on, on the you know, aggregate level, I expect this to be a net positive because the value distribution, again, we're talking about a revolution in how we distribute economic values in society. So traditionally, the financial sector is a very concentrated sector. So we're talking about Financial sector is 8% of the U.S. economy, but financial sector executives occupy about 20 to 25% of the space and highest paid executives in the United States. So it's, it's an it's a industry where value added is concentrated in the hands of a few people. So, but blockchain opens the door for mass participation in ma value generation and distribution through some of the mechanisms that we're, uh, we may talk about later. 
So I think uh, overall, this, in, this concentration in liquidity in the on-chain space is going to drive more democratic value distribution in society. Absolutely. Um, how do you see the value of, or the, the, the role of, uh, of major currencies like the US dollar playing in a hyper-tokenized world? So unlike some people, you know, I know many folks in the Web3 place is, uh, you know, saying the death song of, uh, of the US dollar. Um, I don't think so. I think US dollar is going to get, only to get stronger in the Web3 age because it's going to be one of those what I call super currencies. Because in a world when you have so many tokens that they all need to exchange with one another, it doesn't make sense to have, you know, liquidity pairs for, you know, every token with every other token. You're going to cause extreme, you know, fragmentation of liquidity. So what we do is we have bridged, bridge tokens like US dollar to form, you know, to, to bridge liquidity among trading of uh, different uh, big and small tokens. So any currency that serves as that kind of on-chain on measuring st uh, stick purpose or on-chain, you know, unit of account purpose and uh, bridge liquidity purpose, such as the US dollar, is going to flourish. Um, so your uh, belief, which I, I think I tend to agree, but your belief that the solution, or rather the natural evolution of a hyper-tokenized world and you know, solving that fragmentation problem will be because we will naturally gravitate towards uh, only a few select super currencies for like base pairs. Yes, so we, I think we're going to have uh, super currencies, which I, I assume in the immediate future will be the US dollar. In the future, maybe we have some kind of online uh, you know, new, new token that, that serves that kind of purpose, or maybe some kind of base token from one of the bigger you know, public blockchain platforms. Um, and uh, on the other hand, on the flip side of this, most of the national currencies that we know these days, right, we have uh, 164 government issues currencies in the world, but most of them are very regional with a relatively thin liquidity. And those are going to be, you know, kind of a, a bigger version of community, community tokens in the future. Um, so then we will have a lot of community tokens and then we will have, you know, less than a handful of super currencies. Um, now, now, we're already running a little bit tight on time, uh, but uh, I wanted to uh, maybe just add one fi final question on the institutional side before we move on to the individual side. Um, how do you see the role of a public CBDC versus all the private ones like UST and Tether and USDC, because obviously people want US dollars, but there's so much explosion in the private sector. How will that fit with the public sector? I don't think those are mutually exclusive. I expect them to coexist in the future. And uh, you know, a lot of the uh, applications on chain, which are already multi-chain nowadays, I expect those will be just like the multinational companies of the 20th century are going to be hugely powerful in the 21st century. They are going to determine the economic fortune of some of the smaller ecosystems and smaller economies. And uh, you know, it, it may well be the case that you can have a multi-chain application, and many of these multi-chain applications are going to have a version of them in multiple public blockchain platforms and also the CBDC platforms of different countries. Absolutely, and hopefully the next couple of years we see more uh, clarity on the regulatory side for, for how all these things interplay. Um, so running super tight on time, I want to get to a really other important topic, which is how will Web3 affect all the individuals? Like everybody in this audience, well not everybody, but certainly lots of people in this audience I know are doing staking, that's a source of income, they're doing yield farming and so on. Um, what are some of the major predictions that you have, or semi-major, uh, on, on the individual side? How will it impact all of us? Yeah, like, like just as you said, Kevin, just um, a lot of us here, you already generating some substantial income on chain, right? So, but you are the avant of the population, and uh, the masses are going to catch up with us, uh, you know, later down the road. So traditionally, we have two forms of major ways of distribute economic uh, values in society. Those are capital and labor incomes. Uh, labor incomes are wages and salaries and benefits. Capital incomes are, you know, um, interest and uh, dividends. So those two are the main, you know, channels of distribute economic values in society. Now, I think with blockchain, we have a third way, which uh, I would dub as, uh, you know, generally as staking. But staking means different things in different contexts, depending on the, the app you use and the activities you do. But 
it's you, it, 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 to me, it's a combination of a capital income and a labor income because when you, like for example, provide liquidity to a DeFi app, yes, you are providing that capital, but you also do some activities to generate, uh, you know, um, uh, adoption for that DeFi app. So it's you, you are contributing both capital and labor, and I see that as uh, you know broadly applicable to a lot of staking situations. So I think in the future we are going to see staking as the third major way to for societies to distribute income to the population. And this is going to be, you know, um, also the third most important way for the general population to actually generate an income besides capital and labor. So, um, yeah. Um, from a, you know, economic uh, evolution, I, I think our whole society has uh, 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 evolved so rapidly based on the idea of lending and credit. And it's uh, one of the most powerful uh, tools that, uh, that have driven uh, the economy forward. Banks are making uh, gazillions of money based on this thing. And in a hyper-tokenized world where every asset can be a token, um, why, uh, I totally see, uh, uh, you know, I want to see your thoughts, how do people now become the banks? How do people get to be the lenders and the credit givers to other people uh, when, because they can now tokenize everything and now they can use that as collateral in, in this new world rather than relying on, on analysts and banks? Well, people are always, has always been the bank. It's just that, you know, in, in, in the old world, we, we uh, you know, be a bank with, uh, in collaboration with an intermediary that's called a bank. But people are, has always been the provider of uh, liquidity, provide, provider of resource, financial resources to the economic system through your savings, right? So, but it's just uh, right now through Web3, it's, uh, this format takes on a more decentralized uh, form because of uh, the capability we have with, with technology. So I don't think that, I don't think that the, the fundamental flow of, uh, you know, you have savings of a society being applied to the investment of society and the two sides are not usually the same type of people. I don't think that general value, you know, generation flow is changed. It's just, uh, you know, uh, how you aggregate that saving and how you apply to those investment is taking on a more decentralized format because of, uh, because of the blockchain. So, um, and, and, and relatedly in terms of every individuals, because um, like we said, uh, you have so, so many more different kinds of investment projects, different tokens, different yield farms, and you know, gazillion ways you can generate income. It will become, you know, for many of us, it will become like more like a full-time career. So it, to me, what I see is in the future, investment is going to become an essential skill in everyone's uh, part of your skill set as your adulting practice. So, um, because, because it's a, we, we devote more time to the things that generate more income for us, right? So, you go to work and you do whatever you do at work in order to take care of your salaries, that's your labor income. The same thing, if, if staking is going to become a major income source, then you, we are going to devote more time into that activity. So, to me, it's essentially, I see everybody to become an investor in the future. And you're going to, people need to learn to, you know, make sound judgment about investments, about, you know, what, what kind of project they put their liquidity in. So that, that is going to be a skill that, that, is, uh, um, that is required to survival in the 21st century. Um, when you say, I want for some clarity, when you say the more decentralized way, you mean in a more open sort of peer-to-peer -peer way, or what do yes, you mean? Yes, so, so, so meaning that value capture is not concentrated in some financial intermediary. Right, right. It's just smart contracts and people uh, on the inside of, 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 each, uh, of each contract execution. Um, in your article, you also wrote about one really interesting societal change uh, you called a different kind of globalization in that article. Um, what did you mean by that? So if you look at the 20, 20th century's globalization, we've had uh, you know, over 50, 60 years of uh, globalization in the physical economy, but I, I call that mostly as a you know, wealth transfer from the poor in the rich countries to the rich in poor countries. Uh, because you, essentially it, it's a labor arbitrage of uh, you, you set up shops in, in you know, less developed countries to take advantage of the cheap labor cost and you sell your goods and services to the rich countries. So, you know, income is taken away from the middle class in the rich countries to, um, to, to and, and who benefit majority? Uh, the entrepreneurs in the poor countries. So that, that, that is kind of the income distribution of the uh, globalization in the 20th century. 
in this century with Web3, I see another kind of uh, globalization that is happening in the metaverse because metaverse, you know, by definition, it's globalization. There is no border, right? So you have a globalized economy uh, from the get-go. And to me, that means, you know, in, in, in the coming decades, we might well see reduced uh, globalization in the physical economy because the reshoring of supply chain, because geopolitics. But we are going to see the flourishing of uh, globalization in the on-chain economy, in the metaverse economy. So um, in this space, it's going to be a wealth transfer from people who are digitally, literate, uh, digitally illiterate to the people who thrive and prosper in the metaverse. I don't know if that's good or not. We all need our outdoors times, but uh, yes, I, I, I agree with you. Um, in the globalization thing, um, I think one potential important uh, uh, phenomenon that's going to happen, and I want to hear your opinion on this in the, we only have a couple minutes, but um, do you think these, uh, these new technologies are more rapidly or maybe not before it wasn't even happening, but they're just pushing really forward the rise of one global currency in a, in a much faster way than we saw before. The U.S. dollar is coming forward. People across the globe, they want to do yield farming and all these things. They don't want to hold their national currency. They want to hold U.S. dollars. And this is changing very rapidly. This wasn't the case a couple, maybe 10 years, 15, 20 years ago, but it's certainly the case now. People across the globe want to hold U.S. dollars. What's going to happen here? So that's why you see all the central banks in the world. I, I think last time I read it was uh, over 180 central banks are either thinking or researching or piloting C CBDC, right? So because uh, people realize, oh my God, uh, U.S. dollar is going to eat our lunch um, it, in, in this, uh, in this uh, Web3 economy because of the things that we talk about. We are going to have these super currencies that act as liquidity bridges in a world that, you know, we have so many assets, so many tokens, they're all transacting on chain. And uh, in, you know, uh, obviously in more developing countries, n traditionally people want U.S. dollar and now they, ha e they can easily access it uh, through stable coins. So um, that is going to aggravate the trend of dollarization and aggravate the trend of cryptoization because you also have cryptocurrencies these days, crypto assets eating the lunch of traditional national currencies. The other day, you know, a friend of mine sent me a picture of taxi drivers in the Philippines. You can actually pay uh, SLP uh, for taxis in, in the Philippines now. So that we are only going to see the start of that cryptoization process. So that is really, you know, motivating this, uh, governments around the world to actually do something about this. Uh, some of them are going to be successful, but, you know, again, I see a lot of the regional national currencies that we, that we know it today are going to reduce in their importance and become more of a, you know, larger community tokens. They're not going to go extinct because it, it's always going to be a use case because government collect tax revenues in their local currency and they pay governments, vendors, and employees in local currency. So there is a use case that, that, that is, uh, you know, providing a floor of the value of local currencies, but their importance is going to go down. Is that good? Besides the fact that you just have to pay taxes in your local currency, is it good that, uh, uh, that everybody's going to potentially keep using the U.S. dollars? Uh, I, I think it's, it, it's what it is. I, I wouldn't say it's good or bad, it, but it's certainly, it's a change. It, good or bad, it depends on, who, like, where you sit, right? That's right. I'm sure the governments, the central banks of other governments don't think this is great. Um, well, uh, we're just on time. Uh, thank you, Tasha, for coming. And uh, when, where can people follow you? I think most people follow you here, but just in case they don't, where can they follow you on Twitter and social? Yeah, Tasha Labs on Twitter. Fantastic. Thank you all, and thank you, Tasha. Thank you, Kevin.